that span of the history that's preceded all of you and what we're living through as we speak. Daniel ended his, his, his incredibly strong and powerful remarks by talking about killings in the name of religion. I want to start with that. Um, he talked about the horrific murders of his own family, the use of the machete. That's a question that we're dealing with, and not a question, that's a horrific action that we're dealing with almost every other day, almost every other week, across, uh, across many sections of our, of our world. Where I come from, Bangladesh, in the last two years, we've had repeated machete attacks on writers, on activists, human rights activists, um, across the country, on religious figures, but religious figures who believe in a more plural, more inclusive, more syncretic approach to religion, Sufi mystics, Baal singers, people who sing a kind of spiritual song. Um, and these attacks have come from people who it seems believe that there can only be one kind of human being, a person who is the same as they, who believe that people who do not agree with them, people who have a different understanding of life, who have a different sexuality perhaps, who just make different choices every single day, need to be cut down, not argued. So what I want to focus my remarks on is actually what has been the force against that. How have we focused on our work around gender, whether as women's rights activists, whether as LGBT activists, but how have we used that organizing to counter these forces of hate? And how have we used it to talk about hope and going forward? I'm sure all of the five, 600 of you in this room, you have multiple different views amongst you, but I'm pretty sure that we're united in this room in believing in hope, not in hate. In believing in a future world where we're gonna to come together, not divide each other based on what we believe or what we think about each other. Many of you in this room are going to become business leaders, are going to be professional leaders. You're all gonna be huge successes in whatever you do. But it's really important, we're not just here to think about our professional skills and how we get ahead. One of the reasons we're in this room is because we believe in our connections. We believe that we're stronger together. We believe that 500 of us from different countries will be stronger if we build the links between us, yes. not if we go into our insular shells. So let me let me focus uh, down a little bit more on, on what this means in concrete terms. I said I wanted to start going off from where Daniel ended, from the school of, of machetes. I want to just give you a few stories from where I come from, from Bangladesh, which I hope will be relevant to your life as well. Um, these machete killings that started two years ago, uh, a woman from, a Bangladeshi woman who is now an American citizen, Rafida Ahmed Bonna. She's, in, uh, she's, a financial, she's in financial services. Uh, she's married to a Bangladeshi writer, uh, actually whose day job is also in, I think, technology, uh, but who spent a lot of his spare hours writing about rationalism, writing about secularism, writing about trying to counter extremism and religious fundamentalism. The two of them came back from the US where they lived, just outside of DC. Um, they came back to Bangladesh in February, a very important month for us. It's the month when we commemorate the language movement, um, but also the month when we have a huge book fair in that commemoration. It's really a space where people come together from all around the country, new books are published. It's a really thriving space with all kinds of debates and discussions on around them. As they came out of the space, heading home after a full day, they launched a book, and they were heading home. We were just in the university area, very much like this, a campus area with trees and old buildings. Uh, suddenly they were stopped next to uh, a statue, ironically enough, a statue commemorating our independence struggle. Attacked by five or six people, uh, Rafita's husband, Obijit, was hacked down and murdered and left beaten. Rafita's fingers were chopped off. The police were less than perhaps 20 yards from them. They were surrounded by people, more people than we are in this room. Nobody did anything. Obiji fled to death. Uh, Rafita was critically injured. But she survived and she went on, like Daniel has done, to keep telling her story and keep on arguing for why there has to be justice for situations like this and why we have to fight for equality. Uh, Two years after Rafida's killing, a very good friend of mine and a colleague, Ujulhas Mannan, uh, 
who worked also, uh, was also a US connection here, and I didn't really talk with you about the cases of US connections, but also having to talk to you about them because that's how it went. And, and deliberately talking to you because I want us to think about what these, how these connections work. Here we all are from, mostly from Asian countries, but we are part of a bigger globe um, and a certain political reality. Uh, so a few, a few months ago, my friend Jul Hertz, who worked in the US uh, embassy in Bangladesh, um, but was also, and that was his day job, and the rest of his time, he was very dedicated to setting up an organization, the Proof Fund, which worked around uh, LGBT rights. Not very easy in a Muslim-majority country, although we don't think, we think of ourselves as a secular country, we still have to deal with a lot of conservative social values. And this group was emerging very carefully, very tentatively, but doing it through an appeal to what are our own cultural traditions and values. And Julhas, along with his colleagues, had organized that uh, they, would, or they would join our annual New Year celebration, which is held in April, um, on the 14th of April. It's a date that is actually celebrated across much of Southeast Asia as well. In Thailand, it's known as North uh, In Bangladesh, it's known as Boisha. India, Pakistan, all that, that's our key. Uh, so Julius was organizing a demonstration, uh, not a, a rally, that would be part of the annual New Year's rally. Uh, the night before, the police came to visit him, saying that they had received threats from Al-Qaeda uh, online, through Facebook and elsewhere, saying that anyone who went on this rainbow rally alongside the traditional New Year's rally would be cut down. They came um, and told Julius to call off the rally. They were very upset. Uh, and for the next two weeks, everyone was in fear because the police were trying to find out who's on this rally, where are they, how can they stop? But they stopped the rally, but they were still trying to track them down. Two weeks later, when Julius was with a couple of colleagues who'd been involved in organizing this at his house, a group of people came into his home, uh, three or four people it seems, uh, dressed as couriers, saying they had a parcel to deliver. They came right into his home, and again, with machetes, hacked him to death. Uh, along with his friend. Now, why, why am I speaking about these cases when I'm speaking about gender? Because again, see, how do we fight that intolerance? Do we fight, and, and, and sheer physical violence, do we fight that? You, you, as leaders and professionals, going to take up machetes, should you? Obviously not. How else can we fight it? One of the ways to do it is through the law. And one of the way to, ways to, I think, fight this notion of different values based on different religions is to counter it by saying, yes, some of us have religious faith, some of us don't. But what our religious faith gives us, and for those of us who don't have religious faith, the other values we live by, what do they give us which is common? I think what they give us that is common is a belief in the right to life, a belief in the right to liberty, a belief in the right to freedom of expression, the right to organize. These core rights, which are part of the constitutions of almost all of our countries, I think all of our countries without faith, are also the rights that are firmly embedded in international human rights norms. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on law and international law, maybe because I've probably got about two minutes left. Um, but what I, one, five minutes left, okay. So that, I still won't give you a lecture on international law, don't worry, you can, you can breathe out. But, I just, I want to reaffirm actually that international human rights isn't about bits of paper and technical stuff that you guys have to learn in some class. It's something that actually is going to be about your everyday life, just as it's about my everyday life, and just as it's what made possible Daniel's life. Without international human rights, without that common belief that we have as humanity in life, liberty, and expression, many people wouldn't be here today as Daniel would be here. It's because we're willing to reach out to each other. It's because we're willing to use the law and our understanding of what it gives us and the right to protection that we have that we can build a different world. I want to just give you a couple of examples of how we've done that uh, here in Asia and using international law and constitutional values and our understanding of basic moral principles that also come from religious faith. Uh, and one example that comes out of 
this history of genocide. Now, over the last, uh, if this history will take us back quite a few decades, many of you will know during the Second World War, uh, you will know the history of uh, comfort women, perhaps. Have people heard of comfort women in this room? Can you raise your hand? Do you have? A lot of people, okay. So comfort women, and we'll, 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 many Filipino women, also Chinese women, South Korean women, who were kept in effectively concentration camps and used for sex by, um, by soldiers in the Second World War, uh, maybe from the Japanese army. Uh, after the war, and after justice was meted out through the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, one group of people who didn't get justice were the comfort women. Their stories were erected into sort of obscure footnotes in history. But 20, 30 years later, people began to organize. And that organizing is connected to what we're talking about, empowerment through gender. That organizing came from women's organizations across many of these countries, beginning to find out their histories, beginning to find out about what had happened and not happened to the government women in all of these decades, and beginning to demand justice. It came as part of also an international movement which said that human rights also are about women's rights. Human rights are also about understanding what happens after conflict, not just in the immediate aftermath, but in the years afterwards. And in Tokyo, Japanese activists, Japanese women's rights activists and others got together and organized a tribunal called the Tokyo Tribunal, where they brought together comfort women from all of these different countries to demand justice from the Japanese government. Uh, and again, an important distinction. People from that society, what be it that Japanese soldiers had been held responsible, or had been, were being accused of these atrocities, the demands were being made to the Japanese state years and years afterwards and by Japanese citizens amongst others. At that tribunal, uh, the host invited women from other countries where genocides and crimes against humanity had taken place, who had also not got justice through all these years. They invited Cambodian women, they invited Bangladeshi women, and many others. A woman uh, we worked with closely, who was by then a very well-known sculptor called Firdosi Pumubashi, who had been held in a similar rape camp during the Bangladesh uh, independence struggle in 1971, went to Tokyo to speak. At that time,